only Reverend Jason R. Pointer. Bow. <laughs> By the end of this year, nearly 48 million adults in the United States will suffer from a mental illness. 48 million, that's a pretty big number. To give you some perspective on what that might look like, if you took the 44 most populated cities in the United States and bundled them all together, from New York City's eight and a half million down to Virginia Beach's nearly half million, and every big city in between, this is how many people, adults, will suffer from a mental illness this year alone. To give you another way of looking at it, Texas is the second most populated state at 29 million. New York, the fourth most at 19. Now, I'm married to a math teacher, so I should get this right. 29 plus 19 equals 48 million. That's the same number of adults who will suffer a mental health crisis in this year of 2020. Forty-eight million adults. Then you start adding the kids. It's not much better for the children. One in five for adults. One in six for every child between the ages of six and 17. That comes down to 7.7 .7 million children who will suffer from mental illness this year. That 7.7 .7 million is the entire state of Washington. So I want you to put those two numbers aside for just a second, 48 and 7.7, .7, that's about 55 to 56 million. Let's just hold that over here for a second. The American Cancer Society says that by the end of this year, we will see about 1.8 million new cancer patients. Now to me, that's an appalling number, 1.8 million. That comes down to about 5,000 new cancer patients every single day. That's the city of San Antonio this year having cancer. We aggressively pursue talking about cancer. We've been talking about it for a long time. 1.8 million, it's important. But let's come back to a second to that 55 million. The 1.8 is important, but is it the 55? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we treat the 55 million with the same enthusiasm that we treat other kinds of illness? short answer is that there's still too much stigma involved. It's just such a taboo subject that people don't want to talk about it. As a parent, God forbid you would even entertain the idea that your child would be mentally ill. Adults will be about 43% in doing something about a mental illness they think they have. They're not much better with their kids. Only half of the adults who have kids with mental illness will actually seek treatment for those children. They wait until it's too late, and then it gets bad before it gets better, and that makes the getting better even harder. Mental illness is just something we don't want to talk about. It's still too taboo. It's the old-fashioned elephant in the room, right? Well, as the old adage goes, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. So what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is with your help, take a very big bite out of the stigma that is mental illness. Why am I so passionate about this? At my job as the director of pastoral care at the largest state psychiatric hospital in Texas, we see usually the worst cases. And we wonder, could these people have been helped by earlier intervention? The common sense answer is yes, of course. But why weren't they? The stigma, the shame, so many people wait so long 
Only 43%, remember, will self-report a mental illness this year. Let's do another fun math exercise. My wife would call this predicting. You and I would call it multiple choice. The question is, how long between the onset of symptoms and seeking treatment? So how long is it on average? Now, the answers are, 11 days, 11 weeks, 11 months, and 11 years. Take a quick poll and see where you guys stand. Who's going with 11 days? How about 11 weeks? Anyone? 11 months? How about 11 years? <laughs> We're cheating, I know. Well, I hate to be chicken little and say that the sky's falling, but the, the sky has officially fallen. The answer is 11 years. Unthinkable for any other kind of illness, right? Mm -hmm. A cancer patient couldn't wait 11 days and sometimes live to tell the tale. So yes, I'm extremely passionate about destigmatizing mental illness, taking away the shame completely. It is time we start dealing with our mental health with the same kind of enthusiasm we deal with all of our other kinds of health. But for some reason, in this day of holistic health care and dealing with the whole person, we seem awfully shackled to an outdated idea that mental illness is somehow less than important or somehow not as serious as other injuries or illnesses. Let me give you a what-if scenario real quick and just see if this makes sense in principle. Say you have a 13-year-old son, and on the first day of summer break, he fractures his leg falling out of a tree. You'll get him to the emergency room, you'll have the orthopedic surgeon on standby, and before the end of the day, you'll have a script for pain meds and appointments for physical therapy, right? You do all kinds of things to advocate for your son. And in this day and time, part of that would most likely be social media. You would most likely ask for prayers for your son, post updates before and after surgery, it's a very common thing nowadays, isn't it? Now, coolest for him, there'd be a picture of the leg with the rods and the screws and eventually the cast with all the autographs of his classmates. And then he gets a minute of celebrity as the kid from junior high who got to spend the summer playing video games on the couch. But you would openly rejoice at the journey of his healing. Now let's say that same 13-year-old boy, your son, starts suffering the early signs of schizophrenia. What do you do? Do you even know the signs of schizophrenia? Or bipolar disorder? Or major depression? Or any one of a handful of major anxiety issues that teens regularly get? The truth is, most people don't know because they don't want to know. But what do you do? The truth is, most likely what you wouldn't do. Remember, most parents, 50% will not seek treatment for their children. That has to stop. There's a chance you won't talk about it with anybody. Your husband, wife, life partner, there's just too much stigma involved for you and your child. And I understand that. But something has to give. We have to advocate for our children. Because what happens is it becomes too late at a certain point. Then you become reactive instead of proactive. And that makes the getting better even harder. As a parent, why would you not have your child tested if it was even in question? For example, if you thought your son or daughter was showing signs of being on the autism spectrum, you'd have them at the doctor like that, wouldn't you? Because you'd want to rule it out or in and pursue as appropriate. But we just don't do that with mental illness. Only half of the parents will self-report or report that their children have a mental illness and seek treatment for them. Why am I so enthusiastic about mental health awareness, normalizing, humanizing the process? My mother, 
suffered from a very serious mental illness from the time I was 5 to 15 years old. That's, by the way, 11 years before she sought and received the treatment she needed to be well. That's what drives my heart and my passion for this topic. So there's a handful of things we can do. The first thing on our list is just talk about it. Talk privately at first if you must, but talk honestly. You don't have to be an expert to have a conversation. That's part of how you become an expert. Secondly, with that is educate yourself. Do some homework about the symptoms of the basic mental illnesses and find out what your local resources are. Number three, be conscious of your language. Remember, a person isn't their diagnosis. He's not the schizo in my British lit class. They're not nuts, they're not crazy. They're just sick, having an issue with their brain chemistry, that's all. Number four, show compassion. Would you believe that 20% of the homeless have mental illness? Sure. That 37% of all federal and state prison inmates across the country have mental illness? Sure. H.G. Wells once wrote this. No passion in the world is equal to the passion to alter someone else's draft. My mother, like many of us, still struggles. And like many of us, myself included, she takes meds to help. But after getting well, she became an EMT. She worked on an ambulance for a while. Went to nursing school, became a nurse, and the delicious irony, she became a psychiatric nurse. And eventually helped open the very first maximum security psychiatric prison in the state of Texas. Talk about someone who altered the draft for who knows how many people during her lifetime of service. Not bad for a high school dropout and teenage mom who bore the brunt of her mental illness in the dark ages of the 1970s. I'll leave you with this. Recovery from mental illness is not always possible. Sometimes it's partially possible. Once in a while, you get a success story like my mom. But let's not be quiet about this anymore. Let's speak up. Let's chart a new course and set out to conquer the last great frontier of the public discussion about our human frailties. Let's destigmatize mental illness once and for all. Thank you. Yay, Reverend. You're my new pastor. <laughs>